welcome, and thank you for standing by. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of today's conference. To ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ms. Lauren Soskowski. Ms., you may begin. Thank you so much, uh, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Administration for Community Living's Business Acumen Webinar on Medical Loss Ratio. Um, as the operator mentioned, this is Lauren Zolkowski uh, with ACL, and I will be facilitating our webinar. Um, so for today, we have invited uh, Tim McNeil, who is going to review um, and also explain the medical loss ratio um, and go and discuss how it could impact your discussions with uh, potential payers. Um, so before we start with his um, presentation, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, starting with one, if you have not done so, um, if you could use the link that was included in your calendar appointment to get on to WebEx so that you can um, follow along with the slides as we go through them, but also you can ask your questions um, or comments that you have through the chat function. If you do not have access to the link that I emailed you, you can also go on to uh, www.webx.com and click on the Attend a Meeting button that's at the top of the page, and then enter the meeting number. So um, for today, our meeting number is 664-376-475. That's 664-376-475. If you have any problems getting into WebEx, please call the WebEx technical support number, and that is 1-866-229-3239. Again, that is 1-866-229-3239. Uh, as the operator had mentioned, all of our participants are in, excuse me, a listen-only mode. Uh, however, we do welcome your questions throughout the course of the webinar. There are two ways that you can ask your questions, the first of which is through uh, the chat function in WebEx. You can enter your questions and comments there. It's located on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and then the other is the other way to ask questions. It will be through the audio line. Um, so when that time comes, um, the operator will give us instructions as to how to queue up to ask your questions. Um, if there are any questions that we do not get to during the course of this webinar, we will be sure to follow them up, follow up with you to get them answered. Um, if you have any questions, you can email them to me, and I will enter my email address in the uh, chat box here for everyone's reference before the end of the webinar. Uh, also, as the operator had mentioned, we are recording the webinar, and we will be posting the recording, the slides the, from um, Tim's presentation, as well as a transcript of the webinar online for your reference. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, welcome and introduce our speaker for today, who is Tim McNeil. Uh, Tim is an independent healthcare consultant specializing in health program development and sustainability. Tim, I just wanted to thank you again for being with us today. And with that, um, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. So the topic of today is this, uh, the medical loss ratio. So I'm going to go through a series of slides, and I'm also going to be working with Lauren to show you actually how to look at a medical loss ratio, interpret it, and so hopefully these tools can help you to prepare uh, as you move towards your contracts and pursuits to obtain opportunities and leverage the information that you can obtain publicly about the medical loss ratio performance of health plans in your marketplace and part of your contracting strategy. Next slide. So I'm going to go through um, a few things. What is the medical loss ratio? 
who does it apply to, how to analyze those reports, and how to use that data in a, as part of an overall contracting strategy. Next slide. So what is the medical loss ratio? The Affordable Care Act requires health insurance insurers to submit data on the proportion of revenue spent on clinical services and quality improvement. And the, this ratio of health insurance plan income compared to expenses is the medical loss ratio. So you may remember back when the Affordable Care Act was being passed and debated, there was a lot of discussion about health plans reaping lots of profit and then denying claims for services. And so was a, there was a perception that some health plans were uh, a little bit disingenuous in the fact that they had a profit motive to deny claims to increase their profitability. And so what came about was that they mandated the implementation of the medical loss ratio. So now that it requires all health plans to spend a certain percentage of their total income or their revenue towards direct services for their beneficiaries. So the Affordable Care Act requires all health plans and health plans to issue rebates to enrollees if they do not meet that minimum medical loss ratio standard. So the medical loss ratio standard is 80 or 85 percent depending on the size and the type of the plan. A little bit later we'll actually show you how that figure is created and then show you how you can look up a health plan's medical loss ratio and then based on that figure how you can adjust your contract capture strategy with that plan. Next slide. So the medical loss ratio applies to all commercial health insurance plans. And just beginning last year, it was added in and now applies to all Medicare Advantage plans, and it applies to all Medicare Part D plans. So on the first slide, I said that there was some plans have to meet the 80% medical loss ratio requirement, and some plans have to meet the 85% medical loss ratio requirement. Plans that have to meet the 80% medical loss ratio requirement are health plans that have that are small plans, so plans that have 100 or fewer members. However, any plan with greater than 100 members has to meet the 85% medical loss ratio requirement, and all Medicare Advantage plans, regardless of size, have to meet the 85% requirement. And this also applies to Part D. So you may have a Medicare Advantage plan in a particular state, and they may only have 75 members in that particular state, they still have to meet the 85% medical loss ratio requirement uh, because for Medicare Advantage plans, that mandate covers them regardless of the size of the plan. Next slide. So just to make sure we're all speaking on the same terms that Medicare Advantage plan, sometimes called a Part C or MA plan, uh, Medicare Advantage plans have to cover all services that are covered under Medicare Part A and Part B. And so when a beneficiary elects Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage, then they have elected that to have their Part A and Part B benefits managed by a private health insurance plan that is approved by CMS. So the medical loss ratio applies to all of those plans. It does not apply to someone that is in traditional or original Medicare or Medicare fee for service. The medical loss ratio also does not apply to ACOs because ACOs manage a population that is in original Medicare. When a beneficiary opts to participate in Medicare Advantage, then they are removed from an ACO's attribution list. Next slide. So key concept is uh, the four parts of Medicare. Part A is all inpatient care. Part B is all outpatient. Um, Part C is Medicare Advantage, and Part D is the prescription benefit. So you might be thinking right off the bat of the Part D plan that manages the prescription benefits for a beneficiary. It's very interesting that they also have to meet this 85% medical loss ratio. So if their members are not getting more prescriptions or if their prescription costs are not at that 85% threshold, some of the things that a Medicare Part D plan can do to increase their costs is in the area of quality improvement activities. And quality improvement activities can be things like a comprehensive medication review. And paying for those services allows the health plan to have that cost included in the medical loss ratio. 
Next slide. So Medicare Advantage enrollment is just a, if you're when looking at the medical loss ratio and assessing how plans in your market are performing as it relates to the medical loss ratio, it's important to know what is the penetration of Medicare Advantage plans in your marketplace. So a Kaiser Family Foundation report from, from January of 2015, uh, it shows that about 30% of all Medicare beneficiaries are in a Medicare Advantage plan. And so this does vary by market because this is the average across the entire United States. Uh, a lot of times when I have an opportunity to visit a market, they often feel that 90 to 100 percent of the population of Medicare beneficiaries are in a Medicare Advantage plan, but very rarely do you see a market where, I mean, if you have a market where you're at 40, 50, 50 percent, you're above the average. If you're at 60 percent, you're very high. And so not many markets have a Medicare Advantage penetration rate much higher than that. Next slide. This is the, the map from the Kaiser Family Foundation report from 2000, January 2015. And orange areas have the highest penetration of Medicare Advantage plans. Dark blue areas have the lowest penetration. You see Alaska that has zero percent uh, penetration of Medicare Advantage and Minnesota does have a high penetration with 52% or 51%. Next slide. So you can determine the Medicare Advantage enrollment in your area. I just want to remind everyone that uh, the Administration for Community Living Center for Disability and Aging Policy, there are two tip sheets there that can uh, walk you through exactly how to look up the number of Medicare beneficiaries that are in original Medicare and the number that enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan in each county and some territories in the United States. The tip sheets walk you through how to look, look it up by state and then it breaks, it breaks it down for every county in the United States and it will be listed there. And those tip, the data is provided by CMS. The tip sheet walks you through how to access the data through the CMS website, and CMS up, updates those tables every single month, and so the data that's there is good as of the end of the prior month for which you are looking. So if you pulled it up now, you would be seeing data that's good as of May 31st. This, then once you have that data, then looking up the medical loss ratio, for, that, for those particular plans that have high penetration in your market, it, it provides you with in-depth knowledge towards how that plan is performing as it relates to cost. The medical loss ratio does not speak at all to quality. Quality is something that is, is tracked according to something called HEDIS measures, and we'll have, we're going to be having some additional information provided to everyone at a later time around HEDIS measures. But the medical loss ratio, along with the HEDIS measure, quality, performance, and performance of a plan really gives you information about how that plan is performing and to cost in the medical loss ratio, you can begin to crafting your strategy to work with that health plan to be a value-added person because a value-added vendor because now you can begin to determine their points of pain. You can address those points of pain based on the knowledge you have about how they're performing as it relates to cost and quality. Next slide. So Medicare Advantage plans, just so we're all clear again, is that they're capitated plans. They provide all Part A and Part B benefits. And Medicare does have Part D plans that are separate for medication. And then under the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, Medicare pays 95% of the average traditional Medicare cost in the county. Next slide. Part C plan premiums are risk adjusted. So a Medicare Advantage plan receives a risk adjusted capitated payment. And what that essentially means is that Health plans get a per member per month payment to provide all of the services 
for Medicare Advantage, all Part A and Part B services that are required for the population. That per, main, per patient or per person per month payment is risk adjusted so they can get a higher capitated amount based on the level of health and complexity of the population that they're serving. So the health plan is able to provide information to CMS that shows that they have a population that has higher health costs and multiple chronic conditions, then they're able to get a higher payment because it's a risk-adjusted capitated payment amount. That's what that means. So your ability as a CBO to be working with the health plan and identifying all of the conditions and complications that a consumer has, provide that information to the health plan. The health plan, if they did not already have that information in hand and had not already shared that information with CMS, once they do share that information, they're able to risk adjust to a higher capitated amount if they're able to accurately demonstrate the level of health and complexity of the population they serve. Next slide. This hierarchical condition category, HCC, when talking to health plans, you may, you may come across this. So I just want to make sure that you know this. And the reason this is important for the medical loss ratio is because once you know how that health plan is performing, once you're able to provide assistance to that plan, the information that they're able to obtain, I've talked about they're submitting information to CMS. This is what they're submitting it on. So the hierarchical condition category is the methodology that incorporates both diseases and demographic factors for the population. Based on that clinical diagnostic information that's gathered, the Medicare Advantage Plan submits that data to CMS and then they get the appropriate risk adjustment. So if they fail to proper, properly document the need for services or the need, the level of the burden of disease of the population that they're serving, uh, then they are essentially going to not get the risk-adjusted payment, and they could be getting less money than they actually required or should be getting because they did not report this. Next slide. So the medical loss ratio applied to all commercial plans after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, but it did not apply to all Medicare Advantage plans or Part D plans immediately after the passage of the Affordable Care Act. There was a period of time that allowed the Medicare Advantage Plan to prepare for the implementation of the medical loss ratio, and so the medical loss ratio requirement did not apply to them until January 1, 2014. Next slide. So that medical loss ratio calculation occurs in the medical loss ratio numerator includes all health care paid claims along with any quality improvement activity. And the quality improvement activity, I believe, is an area where many community-based organizations can really excel and be a very positive contributor to the health plan by, one, helping to improve the population and allowing the costs that are spent towards uh, reimbursement of the community-based organization if it can be applied to the numerator, i.e. the quality improvement activity in the numerator line, then that helps improve the medical loss ratio. Um, that the, the health care paid claims plus quality improvement activity divided by the premium, which is the per person per month that's collected minus allowable deductions, equals the medical loss ratio. Allow, allowable deductions are things like taxes that the health plan has to pay. Next slide. So what are quality improvement activities? Quality improvement activities, the, the things that can be included in the medical loss ratio numerator calculation, they must stand up to audit, they must be designed to improve health quality, and designed to increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes. So sounds like a, the poster child for evidence-based programs because they're designed to improve health care quality, they're designed to increase the likelihood of positive health outcomes, and when a health plan spends any of their premium dollars towards quality improvement activities, it's added to the numerator and then helps them meet the 85% medical loss ratio requirement. 
Next slide. Specifically, uh, in the final rule that CMS provided, they listed some quality improvement activities as examples. So some that were specifically listed in the final rule included medication therapy management, things that improve health outcomes, including those that increase the, the likelihood of desire, improving desired outcomes, things that are, reduce health disparities, preventing hospital readmissions, uh, things that help improve patient safety, like reducing medical errors or lowering infection rates, programs designed to increase wellness and promote health activities. So these, these things verbatim came out of the final rule from CMS that says this, all of these are examples of quality improvement activities that a health plan can use towards the medical loss ratio requirement. And this, is, this counts for all commercial or it applies to all commercial plans as well as all Medicare Advantage plans and now even Part D plans can use any of these activities to count towards the 85% requirement. Next slide. So the requirements of the, for individual small group plans is 80%, which are small plans that have 1 to 100 beneficiaries. If a plan, if a commercial plan has 101 or more beneficiaries in the plan, then it, it, it must meet the 85%. Medicare Advantage plans, beginning January 1, 2014, 85% was the medical loss ratio requirement, regardless of size, and the same thing for Part D plans, which also began January 1, 2014. So this is the first reporting year for Medicare Advantage plans and Part D plans because they have to report June for the prior year. So this month, all Medicare Advantage plans and Part D plans are reporting to CMS their medical loss ratio spending for the 2014 calendar year. Next slide. Penalties for medical loss ratio noncompliance. Commercial plans. Uh, a commercial plan that does not meet the medical loss ratio must submit a prorated rebate to all enrollees in the amount equal to the difference. So an example, a health plan, I looked, when I was going through this process, I pulled up health plans in multiple markets, and I looked at a health plan um, that many of us know that's in Texas. And that health plan had an 80% medical loss ratio for the prior year. And then actually in the data, I saw exactly how much money they had to pay to the beneficiary. So it essentially equated to five, that 5%. Five so they had to send a rebate check to every covered beneficiary during that period of time. They essentially took that, the difference of the spend that they should have spent, out 85%, they only did 80%. They took that, they got that, that dollar amount and then sent out a notice to all the beneficiaries along with a check stating that because they did not meet the money cost ratio, that here is their rebate. Um, there, one thing that's interesting is that their their costs, as well as the, the bad PR uh, that they're having to endure as a result of that, is entirely the cost, and also is not added to the medical loss ratio for the following year. It's just a loss for them on both sides. The plans and Part D plans. So, uh, Medicare Advantage plans are getting their premium dollars from CMS, so they can't, in turn send a rebate check to the beneficiary. What happens with the Medicare Advantage plan and a Part D plan, which begins it begins this year, it's the first reporting year, January of 2014 was a start, and then after this first year, if they're not compliant, they have to send a rebate to CMS. If they are non-compliant for three consecutive years, they are placed on prohibition of new enrollments. An interesting thing that also occurs after three years, if they are not meeting that medical loss ratio requirement for, me for Medicare Advantage plans, which is 85%, a notification is sent to all of their currently enrolled beneficiaries, notifying them that their Medicare Advantage plan has failed to meet the medical loss ratio requirement for consecutive years, and that they need to consider looking for a new plan because if that plan continues to fail, 
then they will be terminated and, and, and that they will be banned from the Medicare Advantage program, uh, which essentially could be the kiss of death for a health plan because now all of your beneficiaries are getting a notice that they may need to begin looking for another plan because the plan you're in is in jeopardy of being uh, terminated. The few beneficiaries that remain may leave, and then it's going to be even harder for that health plan to meet the medical loss ratio requirement. And so now if they're non-compliant for five consecutive years, their contracts are terminated. Next slide. So the medical loss ratio tip sheet um, that, that, that explains this and is a guide is available, and it's uh, available um, through the Center for Integrated Programs, and there's a link for that. Next slide. So another thing that incentivizes Medicare Advantage plans to increase their spending towards quality improvement activities that can be counted towards the medical loss ratio requirement is that in for calendar year 2015, the final rule from CMS expanded the rewards and incentive program that encourages Medicare Advantage beneficiaries to participate in activities that improve health. And so it's called the Reward Incentive Program. It essentially can, it allows statutory authority for the health plan to pay a beneficiary a financial reward as an incentive for their participation in a health improvement activity. And then the cost of all of that can be counted towards the Medicare Advantage plan's medical loss ratio requirement of 85%. So this is a significant sweetening of the pot to encourage Medicare Advantage plans to take full advantage of encouraging beneficiaries to have better health outcomes and participate in evidence-based programs and other quality improvement activities, and they're even allowed to pay the beneficiary a cash reward. I, um, I remember when this was when this was ramping up. I was at a Medicare Advantage conference, and uh, there was a panel, and they were talking about how Medicare Advantage plans were going to be using and participating in this, and then uh, many of them were speaking about paying the beneficiaries anywhere from $75 to $150 for their participation in a quality improvement activity. And many times they were talking about things such as diabetes self-management classes and health coaching programs were the type of programs that they would pay the beneficiary between $75 to $150 for their participation and they were going to pay for the program as well, and then the entire cost of that they would apply to the medical loss ratio. Next slide. And so an example of that is uh, one of the Medicare Advantage plans at the same conference I was talking about, they began pulling all of their beneficiaries with a known diagnosis of diabetes. And then they began marketing directly to those beneficiaries that they needed to go to one of their Medicare Advantage Network Diabetes Self-Management or DSMT programs. And then once the beneficiary completed the Diabetes Self-Management Training Program, the beneficiary would receive a check for $75 that they could spend on whatever they wanted. And this is all now covered under the, the Medicare Advantage Reward Incentive Program and many Medicare Advantage plans are now heavily marketing. And they, they're at the same conference they were talking about in markets where Medicare Advantage plans are, there's, where there's heightened competition between plans, they're seeing higher and higher amounts where and beneficiaries are being paid higher amounts for participation in these reward incentive programs almost as a marketing ploy to get to encourage them to switch over to different plans. Next slide. So prevention and wellness activities that can be paid for by a Medicare Advantage plan and applied to the medical loss ratio. So any type of preventive health activity that can reduce the likelihood of high cost disease complications sounds just like a chronic disease self-management class or a diabetes self-management class or a fall prevention class um, sounds very much likely. And so the cost that the health plan spends towards that can be spent towards that 85% medical loss ratio. 
if the Medicare Advantage plan has a high medical loss ratio, then expanded use of preventive health services hopefully can bring down their cost. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. Next slide. So where can you find medical loss ratio data? The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, there is a, a site or a section of CMS called the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight. The link there uh, will take you to the, the main page for that site. Uh, insurers report each year showing the money that was spent on health care and activities in food health care for the past year. Those reports are, June, are due June 1 of the following year. So for June 1 of 2015, then every health plan submitted their data for performance year 2014. That reporting is done by state and for markets within a state. So if you are researching a plan that is operating in multiple states, then you will, when you go to the website, you will see data for that health plan in each state that they're in. So an, an example, I, I was looking up Blue Cross of Texas. When I pulled up Blue Cross of Texas in the, for the medical loss ratio data, I saw Blue Cross of Arkansas, Blue Cross of Texas, Blue Cross, Blue Cross of Oklahoma. So they were all listed there because they, they report by state. And the analysis of the medical loss ratio is also done by state. Next slide. It's a little tough to see, but that link before to the Center for Consumer Information and Oversight, when you go to that link, it, you will bring up this, this web page. Um, it's highlighted at the top, medical loss ratio. When you scroll down, then there is a search tool, and the search tool will then allow you to pull up medical loss ratio data for analysis. Next slide. So as you scroll down, then you you get to the reporting, the, the lookup tool. So the data is reported by year and by state. So you would select the reporting year. Right now, the most current reporting year available is 2013 because they just submitted the 2014 data on June 1. Once it's analyzed um, and complete, then CMS will later post the 2014 data. But you can see the 2013 data now, and although the 85% medical loss ratio penalty did not apply to Medicare Advantage plans until 2014, they still had to report. And so their data is still available, and that is important to know because you can begin seeing trends. Because if they, they did poorly for the medical loss ratio in 2013, they likely did poorly in 2014 as well. Or it's doubtful that there was a, a huge shift because they likely were still managing a similar population with a similar disease set. Uh, set. Um, and so you can see trends over time. So with the lookup tool, you first select the year, then you select the state. I am going to walk you through an example. I pulled a plan in Maryland. Uh, and so I put in the year, I put in the date, I mean, I put in the state. And then I just put in B for boy and click search, and then came up all the blue, many of the blue cost plans. So if you don't know the full name of the plan, you just put in the first letter, and then the search tool will pull you everything that begins or is close related to a plan with that name. If you know the full name, you type out the full name, and then click search. So when I selected Maryland, I selected 2013, I got the options below. Next slide. Once you click on the particular plan of interest, you will see I wanted to see how Care First Blue Choice was, was performing in the Maryland market. Uh, so I, the circle there is something I did just for presentation purposes. It's not, it's not going to be there when you select it. You'll just get the list, and then to the right, you see the blue things that say select the download zip file. Well, if you wanted information about the first health plan, American Republic Insurance Company, you select the corresponding zip file. 
I wanted information specifically about Care First Blue Choice, so I selected the zip file there to the right. Next slide. Once I open that, I it get you click on the zip file. You once you download and open the zip file, then they're going to give you, you, you the option to look at Excel files, and these are locked Excel files for the state and reference. Remember I said that the health plan is reporting and the medical loss ratio analysis is done by state. Care First is one that, that serves people in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. You all know that the, the, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so they still have to split out and report separately, although essentially if you're in Virginia and you're in Care First, you still have the same health plan if you move to Maryland, but for reporting purposes as it relates to medical loss ratio, they're separated out. When you see the one in the, the second item says grand total, that's a culmination of the entire market. But the culmination of the entire market, because the medical loss ratio is calculated per state, there's not a medical loss ratio report for the entire market because every market is assessed on their own. Next slide. This is tough to see. Uh, Lauren, can you pull up the Maryland file? Sure. I'm going to open, okay, Maryland, and now I'm going to... Oh, let me pull up Maryland. Great. Okay. So this is an actual 2013 report for a health plan. And you see, I wanted you to see what, what you're actually going to get if you go and download that file. All of these tables and files are locked, so you can't make any adjustments. In the first column, you see the premium. Item 1.1, that's, that's, sec that's on line 20, says the total direct premium earned. So this is the actual amount that that health plan was paid in premium dollars for the performance year in question. And so the actual amount paid to this health plan uh, over this over the year was $81 million. Now if you go down to section 2.1, you see the total incurred claims. So this is the amount of medical claims that that health plan paid out in real dollars during the same time period. So remember, the medical loss ratio is paid claims plus quality improvement divided by the total direct premium that's earned minus allowable deductions, which are things like taxes. Uh, can you scroll down some? Um, so now if you see in Section 4, that's the health care quality improvement expenses incurred. And so now you see this is exactly to the penny, because these are audited, how much the health plan paid in quality improvement activity for the year in question. So you see activities to improve health outcomes, 816000 Line 4.1. Activities to prevent hospital readmission, 74,000. And so if you, if a, you know, programs that are doing preventive health programs, wellness and health promotion activities, line, line 4.4, you see they spend $117,869. You can then look at 2012 as well, which I don't have, and you can see trends. Um, and so you can begin seeing, you know, exactly what that health plan, how much they spent. You don't know who they spent it with or who their vendors were, but you have an idea about how they're spending their dollars. And this is, this is great information in terms of a analysis of your cu potential customer. You see the tabs across the data? When you open up the file, we're on the summary data file. The next important file, they're all, I mean, the, the next import, important worksheet in this workbook is the part four, MLR and rebate calculation. You can click on that line. This is where you actually see 
the medical loss ratio calculation for the health plan. So for, for this health plan, you see, if you go down to Section 4, it actually gives you the medical loss ratio. And so the medical loss ratio for this health plan was 90% after adjustment. Across the, the tabs at the bottom, there's a rebate disbursement, number part five. So there's nothing here because the health plan exceeded the 85% medical loss ratio, so there was no requirement to pay. If that he same health plan had an 80% medical loss ratio, then in this section you would see how much the health plan in section three, it would say the total amount of rebates and the amount of rebates that they paid out to the beneficiaries as a result. And then it also talks, see section four talks about prior year rebates. So you can begin seeing trends for health plans. So this is Maryland. Now I want to, by contrast, look at D.C. for the same health plan. Okay, this is Chevy the D.C. Do you see it? I do, but I, it's, I don't see. It's right. It's already at the, uh, yeah, if you can scroll down. I mean, up, up to the top. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So here is something striking. I think it's striking. Section 1.1, you see the premium collected? The premium collected for care first in the District of Columbia is $13 million. Then you look at 2.1. Total incurred claims, $15 million. They're losing money before we even get to quality improvement activity. They're $2 million over just in paying claims right off the bat. So you may say, well, my goodness, they're losing money left and right, so they're not going to want to pay for any quality improvement activity. Well, there's a, there's a dual-edged sword. One, they have to improve outcomes. So if their medical loss ratio is $2 million, I mean, if their spend, their incurred claims, just from the beginning, it's two million dollars, two and a half, two and a half million dollars more than their premium to start. You have to wonder what the performance measures are for that population, because this population is having a lot of costs. So if they're healthy and well, then their expenses shouldn't be that high. And so health plans have to one meet their cost projections, but also have to meet their quality projections. So just because a health plan is meeting or exceeding the medical loss ratio doesn't mean there's not an opportunity. The opportunity here is to come in and say you have a, a population with very high costs and possibly without great health outcomes. And our wellness prevention programs can help to turn that dial so that we can begin helping you to bring down that medical loss ratio to somewhere where you're making a profit because they're bleeding money right now based on this stat. Uh, can you scroll down a little more? What, to, to section four? four? Okay. Yeah, four. So now in the quality improvement activity, as you see, I don't know what their readmission rate is, but they're only spending $17,000 to prevent hospital readmission. Um, in Maryland, and I mean, some health plans—that's a, you know, that's a six-figure six-figure number there. So, if I had a solid hospital readmission program and I was operating in this particular market, and I see their medical loss ratio, their spending on claims is out of control, and then I see that their readmission spending or their readmission prevention spending is very low, I think that's an opportunity for me. I also say, well, they're really spending a very meager amount on wellness and health promotion activities. Spending twenty two thousand. But they're spending they're spending two and a half million more on claims. So I think that's also a great opportunity to present how they can utilize my health and my wellness and health promotion activities and hopefully we working together with them by them identifying their high cost 
high-risk, vulnerable population, referring them to my community-based program in the district, and then serving those consumers so that we can help to turn that spending around. So now that we see the summary data, heaven forbid, let's see what the medical loss ratio looks like in part four. Hold on one second, I'm going to pull up, I'm going to try and make it, oh, here we are, okay, go ahead, sorry. Can you scroll down a little and over to the left? Okay, so you see section four, the medical loss ratio, we're sitting at 110%. So this health plan needed, you know, they needed to get to 85%. Clearly, they got to 85% because they were already two and a half million over in claims off just just beginning. They're at 110%, so nobody's making money at this health plan. Because remember, if the health plan has to spend 85% towards claims and quality improvement activity, that means all of their administrative overhead, administrative costs, profit, everything has to be squeezed into that 15% number. In this scenario, we're saying they're already at 110% just in the medical loss ratio. Now all of their administrative overhead, their marketing costs is plus, plus, plus that 110. So they're proud, their expenses are probably 130% of what they're, they're getting in. So, the, so there's tremendous opportunity. Uh, for this particular plan in terms of working with a strong organization that can help them to manage that high-risk, high-cost population. And it's also it's very interesting that this is the same health plan operating in the same market, and the, sep the, the two populations that I showed you are separated by, you know, a, an imaginary border between the district and Maryland. But there's tremendous difference in the cost of the burden of disease between the two populations. So that's kind of the flavor of how you'd go about one pulling up the medical loss ratio, assessing the data, and then applying it to your market and as part of a, a strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, or a SWOT analysis, there's opportunity uh, uh, here. I had to give you an example of another market. I was doing a presentation for a, a group on, in California, and I looked at the medical loss ratio for a, a particular health plan, and I found that their medical loss ratio was 95%. So again, they were spending, in terms of quality improvement activity and claims, 95% of their premium dollars all went and it was paid out. And so all of their marketing, overhead, profit, which with your medical loss ratio of 95%, there is no profit. It's all it's all spent out. They didn't make any money. And so when I talked about that, the, the community-based organization I was working with said, oh, now we understand that same health plan that had a 95% medical loss ratio the prior year made a, now, a formal announcement that they were upping the premiums for all beneficiaries for the subsequent year, and it was going to be like a 20% increase in premiums, and a lot of the beneficiaries were complaining and saying that they needed to meet with the SHIP group uh, team to see about switching to another plan because they didn't want that 20% increase in the in their their premium payments to participate in that Medicare Advantage plan. So the, the data drives the decisions. That health plan had a 95% medical loss ratio, so there's only two things they can do to fix that medical loss ratio. Help bring down the cost of the population by making them healthier or increase premiums so they have a higher amount of collection, so their premium collections are higher to offset their higher expenses. So. Those are the two strategies that then do that. That particular health plan felt as I guess felt as though that they may have exhausted their uh, efforts to improve the health of the population and said we're going to jump towards increasing the premiums. Many health plans that find themselves in that scenario try to delicately balance the two because you increase premiums too high, then you may have a wholesale abandonment of your health plan by when consumers may go to your competitors. 
So it's much, it's much better to control the cost through wellness and prevention. So, Lauren, can we go back to the top one? Great. Um, so, so what is the opportunity with Medicare Advantage plans? So, pro providers that can support uh, these items can bring value to a Medicare Advantage plan. So, increasing the accuracy of the the hierarchical condition scores or, or for risk adjustment that is one. And that is done by helping the health plan understand all of the conditions and complications of disease that a consumer has. Now, oftentimes, I, um, when I'm working with a group, they say, well, the, the hospitals and the doctors are already doing that, so I don't see how me as a community-based organization can provide any value to the plan by helping them understand or have more information about the health of the population. Well, you may be mistaken because when the person is admitted to the hospital, and think about it, if a person is admitted to the hospital maybe for complications of diabetes. So they get admitted to the hospital for complications of diabetes, the hospital is treating the diabetes. Well, they may have heart disease, they may have an amputation, they may have a lot of other conditions, but they're at the hospital for a complication of diabetes. That hospital is coding and reporting and seeking reimbursement to the health plan for complications of diabetes. All of these other secondary and fourth, fifth, sixth conditions that that person has, it may not get reported. I was meeting with Anthem in a particular market, and they said that that was one of their primary problems, is that they would only get one diagnosis from the doctors, one diagnosis from the hospital, and they knew anecdotally that most of their population had three or more chronic conditions. None of that was in their database. And that impacted them because they could not get the proper risk adjustment from CMS because they didn't have the data. They didn't get the risk adjustment. It directly impacts the medical loss ratio because without the risk adjustment, they're getting a lower amount than they should be getting for a population that has multiple chronic conditions. If they had re properly reported the multiple chronic conditions, they get a higher premium. Then the higher premium would go into the denominator which could help to offset the claims and quality improvement costs to help improve that medical loss ratio. So that uh, the other opportunity is to increase access and utilization of prevention and wellness activities. If that Medicare Advantage plan or commercial plan to include state insurance plans for state employees and health plans for federal employees, this implies this, these medical requirements apply to all health plans across the country. So now that health plans can apply the cost that they spend or the expense that they spend on prevention and wellness towards quality improvement and we can increase access and utilization, the health plan is a win-win for everyone. The consumers get access to wellness and prevention activities. Hopefully they have less complications of disease so they also have less costs and less claims. And the health plan can incur all of those expenses and apply them to the medical loss ratio so there's not an offset. So some people say, well, if you bring down the cost too much, then the plan going to be penalized, and so they want the cost to be at a certain level. Well, if they, they would likely much rather spend dollars toward the medical loss ratio on prevention than spending it on complications of disease because, remember, the health plan also has to meet the quality requirements because they have to maintain a high level of quality and meet the medical loss ratio requirement as it relates to costs and expenditures. Lastly, it also provides initiatives for, medic, for health plans to reduce the cost of care and, and actually incentivize them to pay for things like care transition programs because now that cost of a care transition program, every dollar spent is then reported. And you saw in the actual medical loss ratio file that you download from CMS, that hospital prevention, readmission prevention activities is separate, separately reportable line item in the medical loss ratio. So not only can you see how a particular plan did, you can compare them side by side with their competitors in a particular marketplace. Next slide. 
So that's the, the information about the medical loss ratio. I'd like to open it up to questions at this time. Thanks so much, Tim. Oh, go ahead, operator. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1, and you will be prompted to record your first and your last name. Please unmute your phone when recording your name, and to withdraw your question, press star 2. One moment. Thank you. So while we're waiting for some questions coming over the phone, we, um, we received a few over the chat, so um, I'll start there. The first question is, how far can plans go to, to justify their risk adjustment? Or how far back can they go to just to justify the risk adjustment? So if that health plan has had that member for the prior year and they had documentation of that condition, then it carries over. If that's a new beneficiary for them, like after open enrollment they get new beneficiaries, then the health plan has to verify. So there's this after open enrollment and Medicare, this is specific to Medicare Advantage plan, so it doesn't apply to commercial plans. But after open enrollment for a Medicare Advantage plan, there's often this mad dash to, to complete a health assessment on the population. The reason that there's this mad dash to complete that health assessment is because they want that data to go into that risk adjustment right away because they want to get the maximum premium collection that they can as soon as possible. Okay, and now another question is, what is the Medicare fee-for-service administrative overhead allowance? For health plans? Health plans don't administer original Medicare. So original Medicare, a beneficiary with original Medicare is essentially managed by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and providers file their claims with something called a Medicare Administrative Contract or a MAC Contractor, which used to be called a fiscal intermediary, and so they process the claims, but and they're paid, but they have a contract with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to be a, a MAC, that is the administrator that processes the claims. Um, so there's no payment to... There's no, there's, no medic, there's no plan, there's no health insurer involved with original Medicare beneficiaries. Okay, and operator, we'll check back with you to see if uh, any questions come in on the phone. At this time, I'm showing no phone questions. Okay, um, yeah, uh, go ahead, Tim. I did not go over, we, uh, we didn't show them the sheet, I just realized, the DACO oh. tip sheet. I didn't know if you wanted to show that out as well. Sure, I'll, I'll, I will pull that up. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask this next question. Um, who reviews the quality improvement activities? Is the data compared over time? When you said who reviews it, the, the Medicare, the, the health plan, and stop saying Medicare Advantage Plan because it doesn't only apply to Medicare Advantage Plan, it applies to all plans. So the plan submits the data to CMS by June 1 of the following year for the report years. So 2014, all the 2014 data to CMS by June 1 of 2015. CMS analyzes the data that the health plan and a quality assurance division that closely monitors and tracks how that health plan is performing in terms of the medical loss ratio, also track and answer. Uh, Tim, you're breaking up some. Oh, sorry. Uh, so every health, in, every health plan has a quality assurance division that monitors the medical loss ratio. They also, they also monitor the quality performance for that health plan uh, as it relates to their performance on heat measures. And so the mm -hmm. On both sides, the health plan closely tracks and monitors it, and then they submit that data to CM and then use the data. All of the data end up to audit, and so if the health plan is selected for audit, then CMS will have a their MAC, likely the MAC contractor or the QIO or whoever the vendor is, will come in, work with that plan to if they reported it 
turn to this. Tim, you're you're breaking up some more. Can Hello? you hear me? Yeah. We can't hear you now. Is that better? Yes, that's much better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. So, oh, the audit. The audit. So the, the, the health plan submits the data to CMS, and then the data has to stand up to audit. And so CMS at any time can have a vendor come in, work with the health plan, and audit the records to see if what they reported in terms of dollars spent on services, i.e. claims or, and quality improvement activity, can stand up to audit, can be verified, justified, and if not, then they will receive a subsequent penalty for not reporting properly. So the health plan internally monitors, and that's usually monitored by the quality quality insurance division. They submit the data to CMS, and then in case they are audited, CMS is reported properly. Okay, and operator, I'll check back with you again to see if um, questions have come in. At this time, I'm showing no questions, yeah, but if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Thank you. Uh, so, Tim, I pulled up the sheet. I didn't know, did you just want to show it, or did we want to walk through it quickly, or? Sure, I can walk through it quickly, and then if, if, if anyone has any additional questions, I can fill them after we walk through the tip sheet. Okay. Uh, so, so if you go to the the ACL link, you'll pull up this medical loss ratio, and it's a, a file that you download as a PDF, and essentially it will walk you through the medical loss ratio. So just the background, uh, scroll, scroll down some, talks about what are medical loss ratio services. And so you see again here how the medical loss ratio formula is calculated. Well, so it's paid medical service claims plus QIA, again, is quality improvement activity, divided by premium revenue minus allowable deductions equals the medical loss ratio. So the numerator are the paid medical service claims plus QIA. The, the, the denominator is the premium revenue minus allowable deductions. And as I said, allowable deductions are things like federal and state taxes, licensing and regulatory fees. Those, all those things are allowable deductions. So as you see, if a plan needs to adjust their medical loss ratio, the only thing they can do is increase the premium that so the easiest things that they can do. Increase the premium that they collect by either changing the monthly payments that are required or they can increase or adjust their spending on quality improvement activity. The payment for paid paid medical service claims, I mean if someone needs heart bypass surgery, they need heart bypass surgery, there's not much you can do to adjust that other than improving the health of the population. So the easiest things to do to adjust the medical loss ratio, as you see, looking at in comparison to the numerator and the denominator, is to adjust the slide rule to pay or, and or premium revenue. Right. Let's go down some. Here again is the list of quality improvement activities that went over in the PowerPoint. And then all of the quality improvement activity must stand up to audit, and they're categorized and reported and reported out. So the tip sheet also gives an example of services that meet the medical loss ratio requirement. And this, obviously, this tip sheet is is, is focused on community-based organizations. And so we gave an example of a community-based organization that's contracting with an MCO to provide a diabetes self-management training program using the Stanford model. The program is met the, was is fully accredited because it met the national standards and is accredited by the American Association of Diabetes Educators. The, the CDO is a registered dietitian. The dietitian is credentialed or registered with the health plan then they are a network provider for diabetes self-management training programs. And then that beneficiaries that come to that program, the cost 
of paying the CBO to deliver that diabetes self-management class to that beneficiary, the health plan counts towards their cost either in, in claims and quality improvement activity towards that medical loss ratio requirement. So what is not part of the MLR is also on this list, so fraud and abuse detection, prevention services, cost containment, and a broken commission. So cost containment, help, some health plans have divisions where they really closely focus on requests for services so that they can contain the cost and not pay for medical services that are unnecessary or maybe seem unnecessary or maybe the beneficiary may not need them at this time. So a good example of that is sometimes uh, a cost containment management activity will be a beneficiary uh, is given a brand name drug. Maybe it's a, a very high cost and acid, like Protonix. Protonix is probably one of the most expensive ones. Uh, and so, but they've never had a lower cost one, like a Pepsi. And so the health plan says you need to use generic first instead of going to the more expensive brand name. That's a cost containment management activity. It's not anything that's improving the health and outcomes of that beneficiary. So any staff time, labor, personnel that are spent towards doing cost containment activities, they cannot count towards the medical loss ratio whatsoever. The next portion of the tip sheet talks about the, the standard. So 80% for small plans, 85% for large plans. Again, all Medicare Advantage plans begin in 2014, it's 85%. Scroll down a little bit. Part D plans, 85%. Oh, and no important note, medical, the medical loss ratio does not apply to PACE programs. It also doesn't apply to original Medicare because there is no health plan involved with original Medicare beneficiaries or fee-for-service beneficiaries, that's often also referred to. So what happens if a health plan is not a, does not comply with the requirements? It begins to recap here. It's everything we talked about in the slide where they have to pay a rebate, and then if they're a Medicare Advantage plan, they get further penalties. Then we gave you a real-life example, um, so there's a hypothetical example where there's Health ABC is a managed care plan in the, in the district. This is, this is not the health plan that I showed, so this is totally fictional. Um, so this, this health plan had 100,000 members, and they received the $350 per member per month for this, this particular health plan. The medical loss ratio is calculated claims with crime criminal total premium. So if they have 100,000 members covered over 12 months at $350 per member per month, it's $420 million, is their total premium. So that's the denominator. The numerator for this fictional health plan they spent $294 million on claims and $42 million on quality improvement activity. So their total numerator is $336 million. So now the medical loss ratio is calculated by uh, that numerator of $336 million by the denominator of $420 million, which gives you a medical loss ratio of 80%. So this particular fictional health plan is held to the 85% medical loss ratio. Did not, they did not meet that requirement. So as a result, they had to pay 5% of the premium. It's $21 million. To see this, that's a tremendous amount of money. And if they just spent that money on services, or quality improvement activity, they would not have to pay that penalty, they would not be put on this, on this watch list and have their whole contract in jeopardy, let alone the, the bad press of marketing to the beneficiary. Um, and there are multiple plans. I want to begin looking through proofs and seeing as we're doing. I saw plans all over the spectrum, just as we just saw. Some plans were right at the 85 percentage, so you know, if they're at 85%, they're at maximum profitability because profit, their overhead expense, their labor costs, their marketing expense, all has to be contained. 
So 85% is the desired goal. The closer they are to 85%, the, the, the greater the likelihood that they're in positive cash flow. If they're too high in the medical loss ratio, they're losing money. If they're too low, they're paying penalties. Uh, it's going down, Tom. And so that's just an overview of uh, why understanding the medical loss ratio is, is important. Also, it's important to understand how health plans are graded and, and governed. So health plans have to meet quality plus cost. For Medicare Advantage plans, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid, Medicaid Services have contracted with NCQA to provide monitoring and credentialing of health plans that are in the Medicare Advantage program. So every Medicare Advantage plan has to be credentialed by NCQA and be accredited by NCQA in order to be a Medicare Advantage plan. Many Medicaid managed care plans and the health insurance exchange plans also have to adhere to the same performance because CMS has also contracted with NCQA to accredit those plans. It's a little different for Medicaid plans because it's a, it has to be agreement between CMS and the state. But for the exchange products as well as the Medicare Advantage plans, it is NCQA is the contractor to accredit those plans, which means the health plan has to maintain, they have to successfully achieve and maintain accreditation by NCQA. The NCQA standards make the health plan adhere to quality and performance metrics and that often flows down to their contractors or vendors. And so that's why we say that it's important that you're able to provide services to the beneficiaries and report them, and you should be aware of the NCQA requirements that the health plans have to adhere to, especially if you're working with a Medicare Advantage or in a an in insurance exchange product because they have to maintain accreditation by NCQA. And so one of the, the, the how this applies or things is something as simple as case management. There are specific guidelines and regulations for case management that are outlined by NCQA that health plans have to adhere to in order to maintain their NCQA accreditation. But NCQA goes back and says, well, health plan, if you contract out your case management services to a third-party vendor, then that third party has to adhere to the same standards that I'm holding you to for, for case management. So that's why understanding the NCQA accreditation requirements that are held to the health plan are important to you as you're marketing to the health plan. It doesn't mean that in order for, there's no requirement for a community-based organization to have NCQA accreditation for the health plan, before the health plan can apply the cost to the medical loss ratio. But what is important to know is that the NCQA accreditation standards apply to the health plan, and those requirements sometimes roll downhill to their subcontractors. And then at that point, all of those costs can still be applied because they have to meet the quality and the cost containment requirements to operate. I think that's the end of that. So lastly, we talk about what the opportunity is for community-based organizations and how you can get more information. And we've highlighted kind of throughout what the opportunities are and how understanding the medical loss ratio and going and performance of a health plan is important before you begin a negotiation. So it's important to do your market analysis up front, and that market analysis should include looking to see how that health plan performed in the medical loss ratio, as well as seeing how that health plan performed on the quality metrics. Okay. Uh, operator, I'll check back to see if uh, any questions have come in. I am showing no phone questions. Okay. Uh, Tim, we have a, another question that came in on the chat that says, could you um, connect the dots for us between the language of medical loss ratio and return on investment. So the return on investment, the return, the return on investment for every dollar that a health plan pays for an activity, 
they want to have a greater return on the amount of money they spent. So and you want that return to always be greater than the spend out. So if I'm spending money for a diabetes self-management training program, is an expectation that the amount of money that I spend on the diabetes self-management training program and the hope is that the outcome of that will be less complications of disease. The cost of the complications of disease should be greater than the cost of my class to prevent or my efforts to prevent the, the complication of disease occurring. And therein lies the return on investment. So as it relates to the net loss ratio, increasing access and utilization of quality improvement activity should equate out to a reduction in total cost of claims, which will help that health plan get closer to the 85%. Because it's much easier to control your costs around prevention than it is for disease complications. You never know when disease complications are going to occur, and you never know the cost of disease complications. So the quadruple bypass surgery is always going to be much than preventing that quadruple. And it's also much harder to manage when that cost for that quadruple bypass is going to occur amongst your population uh, and spread out. The return on investment is the cost of Tim, we can't hear you. Nothing yet. Oh, oh. I can oh. vaguely hear you. Like I hear, I think oh. you're saying hello. Oh. Nope. <laughs> hello. Can you hear me? There you are. Yes. Oh, now okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Now it's clear. So, okay. so the the with the the medical loss ratio or the with the cost, the health plan, remember, wants to get to 85% because at the 85%, they've maximized their potential profits. And anything over the 85%, they're going to have, they're, they're losing money. And anything under the 85%, they have the problem where they're going to have to pay this rebate and then they're going to have bad press because they have the additional cost of the rebate. So they want to manage their, their expenses very closely. It's much easier to manage your expenses around quality improvement than it is to manage complications of disease. And so as long as your the cost of your program or your preventive health service or quality improvement activity is going to be lower than the potential complications, Plus, you have the added value of helping that health plan to get closer to the medical loss ratio requirement. And then when you add in the potential of helping to report out HEDIS measures, which we'll, we'll talk about in a later presentation, all of that is your return on investment that you then have to quantify and present. Okay, and then um, we've got one another question that came in that says, is the MLR rounded up or down for payout, and do decimals count? It's an, it's an MLR rounded up. So it's rounded, it's, I think it's, it's, it uses the regular, it's above 5, goes up, less than 5, goes down. Okay. Uh, operator, are there um, any questions that have come in on the phone? I have no phone questions. Okay. Well, I think um, we've, those are, let me just check. Those are all the questions that we've received. And since we have about four minutes left, um, I, uh, before we go, I, I did want to say uh, the, so the MLR, the uh, tip sheet that Tim reviewed is on the ACL website. 
it's not the easiest thing to find. Um, we're working on improving that, but if you have any trouble finding it, it isn't. Um, it's in the slides that uh, Tim just presented. Um, that you'll have a copy of that. But if you have a hard time finding it in the meantime, just send me an email, and I can direct you um, to that tip sheet among some of the other tip sheets that Tim referenced are all listed on our business acumen page on the ACL website. Uh, so with that, I, I just wanted to thank you again uh, to Tim for his presentation today and for answering all of our questions. Uh, thank you to our participants for asking such uh, stimulating questions. And again, if you think of any, any other questions or comments that you have, following the webinar, please feel free to email them to me. I have added my email address in the chat box here um, on the webinar. So I think we'll conclude with that. And thank you again to everyone for joining us. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.